All right. So we've got a well, we've we've pretty much I think got got the group here. Um, so we can get Great. started, I think. Um, welcome everybody. And if you just joined, um, we encourage you, this will be a pretty uh, small group, mostly um, caster trainees and internal investigators, as well as a couple of um, folks. I think we have an NIH trainee and a USC trainee. So thank you everybody for being here. And if you're comfortable turning your camera on just so we can um, connect that way as well, that would be great. My name is Molly Cooling, and I'm the project coordinator for Castor's um, Career Enhancement Corps. I know many, if not yeah, most of you, um, and just a couple of kind of, um, just to give you a sense of the structure, a couple of housekeeping items. So this is a panel on developing specific aims for TRS or tobacco, tobacco regulatory science proposals in particular. Um, and we may do more of these panels in the future, um, focus on different aspects of grant making, but this is sort of our first, our first run. Um, so we're gonna introduce our three panelists in a moment. Um, uh, Dr. Ritesh Mystery will do that. And then we'll, um, he and Dr. David Mendez will um, kind of open up the session with some general questions about the topic for our three panelists and others may chime in um, as well. We have a lot of people with grant writing experience on the call. And then we'll open up the floor for Q&A. If you did submit a question ahead of time or questions, thank you. And we have those available to us and we may refer to them, but we also encourage you to, to ask them um, live in the session and anything else that comes up for you. Um, and you can either use the raise hand feature or um, sub submit your questions via the chat function. Um, and then there'll be a few closing remarks and we'll also ask you for um, some feedback. So I think with that, I'll hand it over to you, Ritesh. Great, uh, welcome everybody. It's good to have you all here. As Molly mentioned, it's one of our first kind of events to, to think about grant writing in the area of tobacco regulatory science. When, you, when we, and we have group three uh, panelists to join us. Uh, one representative from the NCI, Dr. Stephanie Lance. And then we have one uh, senior researcher who is a, a PI of the T course at USC, Dr. Adam Leventhal. And one, uh, I guess I would say, uh, junior scientist at uh, Georgetown University, Luz uh, Sanchez Romero, Dr. Luz Sanchez Romero, who uh, recently uh, got funded by K Awards. She will share some of her experiences in, in writing that specific application and that process. So I'm, I'm gonna introduce uh, Stephanie first and then David will introduce Adam and then I will introduce Luz again and then we'll start the Q and A. Uh, so Dr. Stephanie Land, she's a program director and statistician at the Behavioral Research Program in the Tobacco Control Research Branch at the NCI. Uh, she focused on tobacco use among patients in settings of cancer prevention and control. Uh, in addition, her, she has a role as scientific collaborator for our T course site here at U of M and Georgetown University. Uh, she serves on the American Association of Cancer Research Tobacco and Cancer Subcommittee and is chair of the NCAI AACR Cancer Patient Tobacco Use Assessment Task Force. Uh, she is the NCI lead for the Smoking Cessation at Lung Examination Collaboration and the Cancer Center uh, Cessation Initiative. She's also director of tools and resources for the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco University. And she's a member of the National Lung Cancer Roundtable. Uh, before joining the NCI in 2011, she was a co-founder and director of the Reduce Smoking and Exposure to Tobacco Center and an associate professor of biostatistics at University of Pittsburgh. Um, and she's been funded by the NIH as principal investigator in, in two studies, one examining tobacco, and smoking, and lifestyle behaviors in patients, uh, breast cancer patients, and tobacco use and social network formation uh, during the first year of college. Um, David, would you please introduce Dr. Leventhal? Uh, my pleasure, and welcome, everybody. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Adam Leventhal, who is a professor within the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. He is a clinical psychologist and public health scientist who aims to understand and prevent addiction. 
He's the founding director of the USC Institute for Addiction Science, which supports transdisciplinary collaborative addiction research and education, including 77 faculty members across eight schools within the university. Having been awarded more, more than $40 million in grant funding from the NIH and other agencies, his laboratory's current areas of focus are one, adolescent and young adult tobacco, cannabis, and opioid use, Two, addiction among population with mental illness from racial, ethnic, ethnic minority backgrounds with socioeconomic disadvantage and other groups subject to health disparities. Three, the development of medications to treat nicotine addiction. Four, science to inform public policies for regula regulating tobacco and other addictive consumer products. And five, cancer and cardiovascular disease prevention. Dr. Leventhal has authored over 300 peer-reviewed scientific articles, including publications in JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, and other journals. His work has been covered by the Associated Press, NBC, Nightly News, New York Times, and other media outlets. Dr. Leventhal has served on committees and panels to inform federal policies and guidelines addressing tobacco products for, for the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and the U.S. Surgeon General. He is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Health Behaviors and American Psychological Association and recipient of awards for contribution to science, psychology, and mentoring. His personal interests include running, playing guitar, watching football, and spending time with friends and family. So, uh, Ritesh, you know, please introduce... Great. Great, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Luz Sanchez Romero. She, she's an assistant professor at the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center at Georgetown University. Her work focuses on using simulation modeling to estimate population level health in, impacts uh, of public health policies and preventive inter interventions, particularly around tobacco regulation and obesity prevention. Uh, she's part of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center. She works with uh, CISNET, which is Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network, the Lung Group, and the, the T-Course 2.0 site at, uh, at GU and uh, University of Michigan. She was recently awarded a K01 award uh, for a project titled Modeling the Impact of Tobacco Regulations on US Future Trends of COPD. All right, so we have a illustrious group. It took a while to introduce them, but I think you get a great idea about where each of them come from and their amazing backgrounds. I think what we're, what we're gonna do is start out with some introductory questions to you all. The goal of this, uh, this uh, event is to Get some, you know, input from our panelists about how they approach writing specific AIMS pages for tobacco regulatory science program grant applications. Uh, in my view, specific AIMS pages are highly important, but I want to ask the panelists uh, uh, this question to start off with. Um, why would you say the specific AIMS page is so important? when you do put together an uh, NIH grant application? And specifically, what might be some things you may think about when you try to write a tobacco regulatory science application? Um, I'll let any panelist go, go first, uh, or I will just ask one of you to go. How about Adam? I can go Could first. You... Uh, okay. OK, Luzma, go ahead. And. Uh... This is, so what I've heard about a specific aims, it's, it's the first read that they have on your, you know, on your grant. If from that page, they can decide if, it, if it's good or fundable or not. So that's the first thing. And you have to, in one page, catch the attention of the reviewers. For the K, I have to tell, you know, what was the part of the research project, but also I have to include what I wanted to do in my long-term career plan to condense that information. It has to be very simple because, I mean, I think for the FDA grants, you know, 
there's a panel, so there's tobacco researcher, but for other grants that they are not specific, it's panel of not experts on your topic. So you have to be very clear. Uh, so you have to condense all your research uh, career plans in just one page that with very key words that the people can read. Some of the some of the people that I was working on and mentoring on writing my grant, they said, just think that these that the persons read your grant at 3 a.m. in the morning. So you have to be very specific of what they what you want and very simple. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it can, I think it can make or break your, your, uh, your opportunities for funding just on one page. Great, thank you, Lizma. Uh, would uh, Adam or Stephanie like to add anything? Sure, um, I, I definitely agree with Dr. Sanchez Romero. Um, <clears throat> I think like, it's a first impression, right? So when you meet for someone for the first time, you have, they will make all sorts of different perceptions about you. And it doesn't mean that after that first impression, you can't right the ship or wrong the ship. You certainly can in the same way in the grant, um, but it's harder, right? And so if the reviewer starts out your um, application with a sense uh, of confusion, that's not good. And um, at least I can bring in, you know, my former training as a, as a psychologist, um, you know, people, if people have some sort of unresolved emotions or something, and they're reading your project, as unfair as it is, they will negatively interpret as they read through the rest of it with a, with a bias. It, and it's unconscious for the most part. Sometimes it's conscious. And they're like, oh, this person doesn't even know how to write names paint, right? Or, um, or the other way, right? So I think that's, that's an important way to look at it. And then one other thing to, to add is the, um, is, uh, the uh, project summary or the abstract, the thing that's 30 lines. I think many reviewers will review that first. So that should not be overlooked. So once you get your aims all perfect, the don't just like cut and paste and you know write the abstract in, in, in 10 minutes. Um, that's really important because I think that actually is the true first impression. Most reviewers will read in order. Um, and then uh, that's one of the first things they see about the science. Great, I, I agree with everything that's been said, and I'll just add, uh, I, you know, absolutely the significant, uh, the um, Ames page is almost like picking up a novel in a bookstore, look at the title, the inside jacket, maybe the back, you know, that's where you're really forming that impression. And part of what reviewers are looking for at that point is, is this a significant study? Is this an impactful study? So you're, you're gonna try to address that at the top of the Ames page and again, at, you know, throughout and then again at the bottom to really hammer home that, that the study will have uh, an important impact. And there's also a role of, this, of the Ames page in corresponding with the program director or program officer at NIH in advance of submitting the application, I, we recommend that you reach out to someone and I can say more later today about how you choose that person, but what you would often typically provide them is the specific aims page, which is you know one page with um, some rationale background about a bit of methods about your study and the aims. And then you'll set up like a half an hour phone call with the program officer. So that's also where uh, you'll, you'll, that's the sort of the lead document that you'll use in that, um, in that interaction. Oh, I wanted to also add one thing about expertise of the panel. I think Luce had a really good point about uh, making sure it's simple enough that anyone can understand. But one other point there is when your application has been assigned to a review panel, you can go online and look at the list of the names of those panelists and you can Google those people. And if you don't see the expertise that you think is necessary for your research, you can ask the, uh, the person organizing the panel, that's the scientific review officer, to add someone with the appropriate expertise. You cannot name who you want to add, but you can say, I really need there to be someone who has expertise in simulation modeling, for example. Um, Stephanie, I just have one question just to do on that. Um, 
When I submitted my case, I talked to my program officer and she mentioned, you know, send your letter of intent because that will help me. It's there and that will help me think about potential reviewers with that expertise based on the letter of intent, which is usually sent like 60 days before submission. Is that true? Um, yeah, I, I believe that is true, that they use those to help identify reviewers. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, David, would you like to ask the next question? Sure, um, thank you, Ritesh. And, and I, I, I want to also ask a follow-up question to this one. So what are the particular elements uh, that are, will be necessary to include or not, or be careful not to include in a specific games directed to tobacco regulatory science. So because we, we have a particular target in tobacco regulatory science and there are things that the FDA have jurisdiction on and doesn't have jurisdiction on and you know maybe some pitfall in the in the uh, specific games can you know bias or can can you know uh, you know influence uh, the the your they review one way or another. So what do, what do you think about that? Stephanie? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just uh, say that the aims that you're writing for tobacco regulatory science might need to be more specific than what you could do for a more general funding opportunity, because it does have to be within the regulatory authority of the FDA. And I'll show you some links later with my slides that uh, provide specifics about what, what that authority is, what they're able to fund, and also what their priorities are. And they, they're not allowed to fund research that's outside of that. And so we're in a, in a more um, traditional grant, you might be able to say, we're gonna examine X, Y, Z, W, and you know, et cetera. But within something that is meant to be funded by the Center for Tobacco Products at FDA, you have to be very specific and keep it narrowly focused. Yes, yeah, sure. so happy to follow up on that question. I think, right, yeah, I, I think writing regulatory science grants is really challenging um, because I think that, and it's, a, it's important to educate the reviewer about what is regulatable and what is not, because what I found is that reviewers are interested in, in explaining why, why this, why that, I, and I, they want to see innovative measures and methods. However, what is actionable evidence for the FDA may not be a novel measure that's only like gotten some preliminary evidence to show that it actually is related to behavior or health outcomes. And so I, uh, and this is, you know, something that is more recently I've been doing, but just trying to kind of acknowledge to that sometimes the project may not be entirely innovative um, but it does provide actionable evidence for the fda and so this is probably stuff more beyond the aims page in your application but it, i think it's good to say in the aims page and this is only something i've been doing recently like, if we find this then the fda can do that and um, I think even in kind of circling back to my point before, I think that, um, and, and Dr. Lang can speak to this, but even if reviewers may not appreciate it because they may not, they may be more kind of thinking like traditional programmatic science rather than kind of applied um, policy focus science. I think that the, the, um, the program staff may be able to select a grant that has a score that's a little less strong, but is very provides very actionable evidence than another grant that scored more highly, but may not be as impactful. So I think that that's important as well to consider. And yes, I agree with that. 
Great, thank you. Um, so some of our, our audience uh, members are applying to K grants and some of them are applying to our grants in the coming future. I wonder what advice you have for them when they think about crafting the specific AIMS page for our grants versus K grants. And if there's anything you can say specific lead for tobacco regulatory science grants that would be I think appreciated so I can I can just show really quick my specific aim page just to highlight something Great. that I think it's particular for the K awards um, wonderful okay can you see it it's an Excel and um yep okay so um I mean I think it has to be, you know, uh, the background and then a little bit of uh, the second paragraph, you know. Uh, but then I well, I highlighted my my general aim to watch produce, and because it was specific for FDA tobacco regulations, so I I was uh, to make sure that I have like oh FDA tobacco regulation and constantly you know linking my project with the regulatory. Um, part of the FDA. What I also did is I highlighted uh, the area that my project was going to target. You know, when you read the grant, they have like, oh, health effects or impact analysis, behavioral. Um, I make sure to add this, so my answer to the impact analysis call for the grant. And then I also highlighted uh, my long-term career plan because that's the career awards right you have to link is for career awards is not only the research as an arrow grant it has to be linked with your with what are you going to learn with that project and at the end what's your long-term career plan so this is what i did you know i want to become an independent investigator with expertise in conducting population simulation modeling science for tobacco regulatory regulation so they can see how my research project, my long-term career aim, link with the different aims that I was proposing for my research. That's what I did specifically on, on my career work. And one of it also it's, um, I had to talk a little bit about the, my mentoring team. I had to put that in my grant. I don't know for the art, for, for my care, I had to mention my mentoring team and how that's going, you know, the strengths of having that mentoring team as part of my grant, which I put here, uh, Dr. Levy and Dr. Mesa and what they did. And uh, so it has to link all this part, like how your mentoring team, it's important to fulfill those research aims and how those research aims are going to help you to become what you want to be when you become a grown up researcher. Um, I can, uh, I can, uh, I don't want to cut you off. If Was there more to say? No. So just no. to add a little bit to that in terms of the R, because I'm, I work with R's and other um, types of research grants. I don't work with the training grants like the K awards. So that was, I'm, that was wonderful that you shared that. And um, in terms of R's, what I'll typically see is below the aims at the bottom of the page, another maybe two, three sentences about the significance of the project and the impact of the project and maybe how it, um, how it is responsive to the particular funding announcement. And then within the aims, we sometimes see hypotheses. I think those are viewed as a strength. Sometimes methods and are actually included within the aims. I don't, I don't know if that's a strength or not because I see, I look through several, um, applications from successful investigators in preparation for today's call and some include the methods within the aims and some do not I don't so I don't know what's what's best there certainly some methods somewhere maybe in the text that's above those aims um, but those are some things I noticed that might be a little different for an R All right Dr. Leventhal would you uh, like to add anything sure um yeah, I think like for the for early career K awards, it's a it's a story, it's a narrative, um, because um, as Dr. Sanchez Romero was explaining, it's like you're trying to convince the reviewers, like you say, hey, the field needs more of these or needs someone like this. 
I have a training uh, and I have the skills to be this, but I just need this, right? And, and so therefore the current uh, early career award proposes this and it's about the candidate and, and your research plan. I think sometimes like people writing early career K awards get very, very um, focused on the research plan and they should, right? Um, but it's about the candidate and the research plan is merely to supplement the candidate's training. So I think that that's important to consider when you are um, writing a K. And, and I, I like that, how that was put in the aims because sometimes you see sometimes um, early career K applications, they'll write the aims that are, so that they're only, that so that you wouldn't be able to tell them apart from an, you know, R21 or something or a small R01. And I think it's nice to remind the reviewers that they're reviewing a K award. So. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for, for those uh, uh, thoughtful answers. I, I think we wanna open up the, the floor to questions from the audience. I know many of you submitted some questions beforehand, which all of the panelists already saw, but please feel free to ask one of those questions or another question that came, that came up uh, during this session so far. So uh, we're gonna open up the floor for the next 20 odd minutes for you guys to ask some questions. So just raise your hands uh, and we'll call on you. Oh, Luce, okay, go so ahead. I, I, I just have a quick comment and I just, just heard it you know, yesterday because I was talking to, uh, to a more senior researcher and what he told me or what they used to do, you know, they have, all this mentoring thing in his research group. But what he told me, and I think it's very important and may help, you know, when scientific review, doing the scientific review is they, um, they're recommended to when you are writing to write a flow diagram of your specific aims and just do like a narrative of how they are linked to each other. And if you cannot see that, or if someone else cannot see, you know, the sequence of how it helps, then you have to go back and, you know, rephrase it. But that mm -hmm. just gives you like an overall, like first impression about your aims link and see if you are in the correct, you know, path to writing your email. So I think, you know, if you don't know where to start, I think that's something good and you can start working towards that. Once that's ready, maybe that helps uh, to build on to that. It's excellent advice. Yeah, questions. Yeah, Buki. You're muted, oh, Buki. You're muted, Buki. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to ask one of the questions I sent in, which um, was also on the care award. So the tricky thing about the care award for me is the fact that it goes to a maximum of five years. And um, you're expected to factor in the fact that you write an hour one in the next, in the last two, one to two years. But there's also the fact that you have to, one of the major things they used to grade is that it's not developed enough, so it's too small, like this is not, or it's too much, so you don't really know what you're doing. So it's kind of, I don't know what, what advice you give in terms of striking that balance <laughs> of being too small, being too much, and also factoring in the fact to factor in the R1 that you have to focus on in the last two years. So whatever advice will really be helpful. Mm. Uh, so um, I don't know, um, but they, I can go first. What they recommended me is, um, you know, because for the K you have classes and then you have research. And then what I did is also I have the same problem and they asked me, you know, it's like ideally just put three aims or not more. Uh, try to say, you know, classes and publications, uh, not, uh, you don't want to be full by classes on the first year. And, uh, but what it helped me is I really had a lot of help. So I was building my career plan and my research project with a mentor researcher. So it was like a more senior and they were really helping me like, you know, that's too much or 
oh, you're proposing this and that takes you three years. You cannot do that in the first aim. So let's try to reduce it. And as Dr. Adams said for the K Award and what other researchers have said is 50-50, like 50 your training and 50 your research. So you don't have to make like a super big project because they are expected like part of you and your research and then your training. So once you have your plan, look at it, talk to someone, you know, more senior. And um, ideally, if they have experience with K, that's better. And also you can look at other, you know, successful K and see, you know, how many classes do they have? How's the research project? So they can give you their perspective of in terms of timing. Um, I think at some point I put, oh, I'm going to write uh, five first five first author paper per year or something like that, clumping crazy like that. And they said, no, that's too much. Let's just complement it with other things. So they will help me. Um, so you can just kind of start with what you think, you know, you think it's good and they can feel that's too much. That's very little. Uh, try to set like a good balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. David. So, uh, yeah, so let me ask uh, to the panelists, this might be a naive question, but uh, not being, um, you know, I, I, I'm not familiar with the K awards and I know that uh, uh, a few of our trainees are writing K awards. So the, the, the specific question I have is, uh, and I was intrigued by something that Dr. Leventhal said and, uh, and, and Luz uh, reiterated that uh, uh, the, the, the main goal of the K award is your development as a uh, as a researcher. So you want to fill a gap uh, of uh, the, this kind of person does not exist. It will it will improve the field. Uh, it will benefit the field if you know this person will become this. Person. So is that that should be on the specific aims, or is the specific aims just related to the research that accompanies? that, um, uh, you know, they, they, you, you know, you're, you're trying to become that researcher. So is that, is, are, are they, so again, is the specific aims of the K award should include your development or your goal as a researcher or not? Um, so I can, so me for my K for a specific aims, I I just put like a couple of sentences of what was I going to learn. I developed more about the courses and the classes a little bit more in the section that it's candidate background, because uh, it goes before all the training and mine things. So let me share it again really quick. Um so for example, here in this paragraph, I talked about you know my mentoring group of for Libby and Dr. Mesa, what do they are, and my mentoring. And then I put, you know, within this environment, I will further develop my modeling expertise, apply modeling resources, and mentoring training in modeling development, pulmonary disease, and tobacco regulatory disease science. Uh, so I just briefly mentioned, you know, like the big topics that I wanted to learn. Uh, so it's my, my mentoring group, my environment, what I expected to learn from that, and that will help me, you know, to build a comprehensive history disease model for the development mm -hmm. and progression of COPD. So I just briefly explained here, you know, my mentor group, a little bit of the training and what I wanted to learn to become this. Mm -hmm. And I explained more in the candidate background, more specific, like, oh, I want to take these classes because it's what's going to help me there. And the way you do with the, when you explain when I was explaining um, the other section of candidate background and training, you have to link your training and how that training is gonna help you achieve M1, M2, or M3. It's like, oh, this training is gonna correspond to M1, uh, M2, and that. But, but I see that, that your aims, uh, I saw that your aims are specific to your research. Yes, right, that's what my, my aims, yeah, my aims are specific to my research, just in the specific aim, I just put, you know, a section of a little bit of what I wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Adam, Dr. Levinson had, a, had a, a, an opinion that you could 
put something about well, yourself in the aim statement. I, well, yeah, I think, well, so, well, so first of all, forgive me because uh, the NIH has changed like the format for, for the, the early career K awards in the past several years, but, but yeah, so you have like training aims, like a kind of a, you know, the version in your career plan of your aim. So sometimes people call those goals and you might have anywhere from three to five of those typically. Um, and so I'm not saying that you need to take that whole entire um, argument and then put it in your research, the, the science uh, research plan part of your specific aims. But I think uh, like Dr. Sanchez Romero put in, kind of like integrating it and tying it back to your training plan is really, I think typically an effective way. And then I think it also, it, it primes the reviewer um, so that I think that um, people who are reviewing grants, who've reviewed a lot of K awards and have a lot of experience might be thinking this already, but sometimes when you haven't reviewed that many early career K awards in your reviewer, you're, you're just primed you kind of unconsciously are thinking and you're just like thinking this is a research project this is a research project this, you know and you don't want the reviewers to interpret your research project as a standalone research project mm -hmm. it's really embedded and integrated so i think in the aims and then when you go through your research plan um you know to the extent to which you can in the in the early career k award talk about again more directly about how this will link into your subsequent R01, which is the question that that um, Buki had, right? And so that's another portion where you can do it, but you don't need to necessarily rehash everything. Um, uh, you know, a little might not hurt, you know, if you had somewhere in your research plan to say how this is like integrated with my three training goals somewhere, maybe end of significant, I don't know, or at the end you know, of the whole entire research plan. But um, those are just suggestions. And 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 as uh, all the, the, the panelists know, um, there there's no one formula to get a grant. And sometimes you do something <laughs> and it works. And sometimes you do the exact same thing and it, and it doesn't, so, mm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me just share my, my grant super quick, just just so you can see it, David. Uh, or is it, is it this? So yeah, just as Adam was saying, the first part is the specific aims. And then as a second section is your candidate background. So that's the second part that they usually read. And then you explain more about yourself and you know the classes. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, then what you see first is the career goals and objectives. That's mm -hmm. like, that's the, well, then after that, then it's the research project. Okay. Excellent. Um, Thank you. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, very, very helpful. Uh, questions from the from the audience. Oh, I remember. Oh, go Alex. Yeah, I think Alex, go ahead and then Rion. All right. Um, so my, my question is about um, how do you establish the significance of your work in the specific games section? in a way that is appealing to a reader um, and maybe persuasive. What's, what's the way by which you put that first impression down? Um, even, in, even in an instance where you maybe weren't even sure of the, the significance outside of the, the scientific soundness of your work. Mm. I'm thinking others on the call may want to weigh in, um, but I, I guess I would just say that often we see these pages starting with um, some statement about the overall, say, number of patients who have a particular disease, like if it's about COPD, you know, how, how big of a problem is that? Um, you know, in the U.S. or for, you know, for tobacco, how many smokers there are? Um, and I think as maybe Dr. Leventhal mentioned earlier, discussing how it will help FDA to make a particular regulatory decision would be another uh, important factor. Mm 
Yeah, I can I can chime in. Um, I I I agree with with Dr. Land. Well, I do want to say like I I think that for a TRS grant you can skip like the tobacco is the number one cause of preventable death, but but you can but if you're focusing on COPD you can say like you know people may not know they may be thinking about cancer right and and heart disease so if you say COPD accounts for X percent of all tobacco related deaths, you know that's a good place to start. Um, but I think you know Alex you're I don't know if this was where your question was coming from, but you, you do have to, you have to have the significance set before you move forward, right? And as you write the aims, because most of the people's, most people's writing process, right, is like they want to get a decent draft of the aims done before they say like, okay, I'm moving ahead with some variant of this project, plus or minus, you know, uh, like it's going to vary a little bit, but this is kind of like the scope. And so it's really important to have that set in your mind first um, and significance and in, in this for these mechanisms is about how it impacts regulatory science. So FDA decision making. And then sometimes some of the other like regulation is a little bit more straightforward, but I think some of the other areas within FDA's purview are a little bit more challenging to explain to reviewers, um, but you know, FDA is also interested in methods and tools that can be used for other researchers who can address specific regulatory questions. So if you come up with the new simulation model, right, um, that uh, may not necessarily, the end goal isn't necessarily to answer a question about a hypothetical regulation and whether or not the FDA should do it, but rather a new model so that the F so that many researchers across the nation can apply it for regulation X, regulation Y, regulation Z, you know, unanticipated. I think that is another domain in which, so, you know, I don't know if I'm rambling a little bit, but you know, the, the, the significance is like the applied impact, but also the way it changes the field in a way and, and changes the way researchers uh, approach um, these scientific questions. And of yeah, course, think... the, the FDA does post their regular, their priorities, their research priorities. And so that gives you a good hint as well. If it's something they're saying that they're interested in for the Center for Tobacco Products Funding, then that's a good, I think, a claim to significance. Brian? Um, hi, everyone. So I do have a slightly different question. So um, my question is about how to select study sections. So it's kind of the next step. So I guess if people have recommendations for research using you know, tobacco control as the topic and kind of secondary data analysis or micro simulation models, this is probably not the most general NIH topic. And I wonder if there are any study section suggestions that you have. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll just uh, comment that we do have a funding announcement for small grants for tobacco regulatory science using secondary data analysis. And those projects are reviewed by a special panel that's brought together just for that. Um, and in general, I wanna make sure everyone knows you don't have to choose a study section. There may be some strategic reasons to try to do that, um, but it is a bit of um, maybe an art and there's not a lot of, um, I don't know that there's a lot of clear strategy. You don't have to do it at all. Uh, the Center for Scientific Review can assign your project to a study section but the, also the Center for Scientific Review has a web page with a tool where you can uh, get rec, you know, automated recommendations for study sections, but others on the call may have uh, good strategies to share. Um, and well, I guess one other point is the standing study sections, you can look at the membership and see what the expertise of those individuals is. Uh, yeah, and for the TRS mechanisms, right? For the KO one, it's it is just it is what it is. You don't even choose, right? There's just one, I believe. If you're submitting the tobacco regulatory science um, 
call the RFAs. So that takes a little bit of the guesswork out of it. But yeah, well, for other grants, it's it's it can be challenging. But and sometimes program staff can um, has ideas and you know or or the SRO of one of the study sections too. You can send them your aims as well in advance, and they can give you feedback. Um, and then if not there, they'll recommend potentially another study section. Yeah, I did it. I applied to one of those, the TRS EMDA. I didn't have the study section, but I, I mean, as all grants, you have to do it with a really long time in advance. So when I had like a draft of my specific aims that I thought it was okay, then I talked to the, it's not the program officer, their names comes at the end of the grant for like the institution. So I talked to the one that it was for in an in, in CI. That is the program, that is the, okay, the program officer, yeah. The program officer and talk to her and see if the way my aims were structured answered to that institution, to the priorities of that institution. She even recommended me, you know, oh, uh, it, the way they are out now, they may not be NCI, it has to be to NHLBI. Uh, so then I talked to the you know to a program officer at NHLBI, and then what I had to do was because it's just a lot of that is just on the way you work, what you want to do. So it was not that I had to go to NHLBI. I just need to rephrase what I want to actually answer NCI. So that helped me, and I didn't. I think it was in my letter, not the letter of intent, the other one of the grant. I put that place assign it to NCI because I already talked to them and they know that I was going to send it. Um, and that's what I mean. I didn't select any study section. And I'll just add something about choosing the institute. So you just heard discussion of whether a grant would go to NHLBI, National Heart, Lung and Blood or National Cancer Institute. And you don't have to make those choices either, um, but you may want to. And the way, well, there, there may be some strategic reasons because some sometimes institutes um, may have more favorable funding than others. But, and, and certainly there are differences in terms of the scientific areas that are, that are covered or that are a priority in the different institutes. And it, there are many grant applications though that might be able to go to more than one. And if you have a decision like that, I recommend thinking about your long-term career plan because you can establish a relationship. So if you think you know, cancer or cancer control population sciences is gonna be your long-term career, then you may wanna to come to NCI if it's more about addiction um, or more about um, you know, um, COPD, then you, you would go to a different institute. Yeah, I guess you can't stress enough to reach out to the NIH program officials and SROs. I think they are amazing people who really, really do try to help you get to the next stage. Um, so I think uh, yeah, as much contact you can have as you develop your idea, uh, the better. Yeah, and maybe I can just add that, that to that, that in case you're not sure how to find someone um, to reach out to as as Dr. Sanchez Romero mentioned, it may be at the end of the, if you're applying to a particular FOA, the person at the end is a good one. Some, if you already have some kind of grant, you can reach back out to the same um, program officer that you've already talked to before. And you can talk to multiple people. You might wanna let them know, hey, I'm also reaching out to your colleague, but there's no, we don't have a lot of turf. Uh, we won't be offended. And if, for example, you're interested in tobacco, but you're also working on something, you know, there's an addiction element and you wanna to talk to two institutes or you wanna to talk to implementation science or um, healthcare delivery, you can talk to multiple people. And, and um, yeah, so that's, and, and we're, all, we're all open, we're all available. Um, just to complement this, just my experience, it also helped me, you know, to target the K award I was going to apply because I applied for a K01 and I didn't know if I was eligible for that. So I just sent you know oh this is my background super brief like a couple of this is my background and I'm and I'm hoping to apply to this grant and I am I eligible and they said yes so I just you know then I just sent it because it may be something that you are not so then you have to change the K uh, you are applying. Great, thank you. We have about nine minutes left, and we promised about three to four minutes per panelist to say some parting words. 
So I think we should go on to that phase of our hour. Uh, how about we start with Steph Dr. Stephanie Lance? She has prepared some slides, and then we'll go, uh, you know, down the rest of the panelists. Uh, so Stephanie, if you would uh, want to share your slides and, and say a few words, uh, uh, that would be great. <laughs> we see your slides. Okay, great. I've used a road trip. Uh, template here because I do think writing a grant application is a little bit like a, a long road trip. And um, some of these, I'll skip quickly over anything that we've already talked about before. Um, in terms of writing aims, I definitely recommend workshop that within your group, anyone you can get feedback from, really beat it up as much as you possibly can. And it, it can't be overdeveloped in my opinion, to develop it as much as you, as much as you can. Um, and we talked already about sharing draft aims with your NIH program director. I'm sorry, we have so many terms that mean basically the same thing, project officer, program officer. Um, and so on. And as we mentioned, the AIMS must be responsive to FDA's both their regulatory authority and also they have a mandate to educate the public about the harms of tobacco products. So they might need to be more specific than they would be for a more typical grant. There's a, a web page that gives you uh, the research priorities and you could Google this or, you know, this is on the NIH Tobacco Regulatory Science Program website. And then I've also listed on the right side of the slide some helpful resources that I mentioned earlier, the research priorities list. There's a paper in nicotine and tobacco research that is, is good to read. And again, uh, the Tobacco Regulatory Science Program has an, another part of their webpage. They actually list all the funded research, so all the projects that got funding. And that's helpful for you to see, number one, which, and, and it indicates which institute the project was funded by. So you can see, okay, what did they go for? And you also wanna make sure you're not reproducing something that's already been funded because um, the FDA can decide, you know, we've already spent, you know, allocated some money toward that topic. So we don't wanna pick up another grant on that. Um, so you wanna make sure you're not overlapping something that's already on underway. And the, um, in terms of general grant writing, I've listed a few resources here that the CSR, those initials stand for the Center for Scientific Review and some resources here about writing grant applications. I also found some nice web pages just Googling and some of the other institutes at the NIH have nice web pages. There's a YouTube video of an actual, what we call study section or review panel review. I think that's helpful to understand what your application is gonna go through in that discussion. And there, you know, seek out opportunities to be on review panels as soon as you can. It may be a little while before you would be eligible to do that, but your senior people in your group can recommend you as an ad hoc reviewer for a panel, even when you may be a little bit more junior. It's super helpful, I think, to participate in a panel. And that's it. Uh, happy to discuss further. Please do feel free to reach out to me. And I can also connect you to people in our training branch, because that's not what I do, the K awards, but uh, there are people like me who focus in that area, and I'd be happy to connect you. Thank you, Stephanie. That was very, very helpful. Um, how about we, we move to Dr. Lou Sanchez Romero next, and we'll end with Dr. Leventhal. Good. Uh, so it's my recommendation. Take advantage of all the resources that you have. Uh, I took Ryan writing courses. I read, I read successful grants. I sent my my specific aims not only to my immediate you know mentor. I sent it like to six different people. Uh, and something that encouraged me a lot is that I've heard in one meeting a super senior researcher. She has tons of experience, successful in grants, and she mentioned, "Oh, I I sometimes have to write one specific aims like three thirty different times until we get like the good one." So, so please don't be discouraged. Think about it and take your time because it takes time. It's not going to be just three drafts. It's going to be a lot until you are, uh, until it's something that is happy. But uh, yeah, I think it's consistency and just ask, ask for help. I think people have been very responsive for me and they are happy to look at my grant, the people with experience. So take advantage of that, of the people around you. Thank you, Liz. Dr. Leventhal. 
Sure. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel. And yeah, feel free to email me any uh, of the attendees if you have questions. Um, so uh, let's see, additional points that weren't already raised would be, um, I mean, it's a persist, you have to be persistent. I think that there are some, there's like a small portion of grant ideas that are kind of just slam dunks. And I don't know if I've had one of those in my career. <laughs> and then the, most of them are in the middle. And then there's a lot of, you all are scientists who so understand confidence intervals. Um, you know, the last R01 that I got was on the fifth try. Um, so, you know, uh, don't be discouraged. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that's it. Just let your passion come out. Um, and, and believe in your science. And uh, don't let all those kind of other voices where it's like, oh, I heard you shouldn't do this. I sure heard you shouldn't do that. You know, if there's too much of that happening, it can kind of be a little debilitating. So just take a step back, remember, yeah. And the last point is kind of related to this is the forest from the trees phenomenon, especially, I mean, it happens to all of us is that you get so entrenched in your um, project and your grant or sometimes a paper where you're like, oh, what about this detail? What about that detail? What about that detail? Um, and you forget that, as was mentioned earlier, the reviewer might be just picking up your grant on well, three in the morning or whatever, or on the plane back from the SRT conference, tired. And, you know, so th they're not going to have the same level of acuity as you. So try to be as simple as possible. Oh yeah, and you're not writing for like you're not you're not writing for the experts in your field. There will be one who is a real expert in your area who's reviewing your applications. There'll be another person who it's kind of like a side area. This is usually, and then the third person will be probably not in your area at all, but may know tobacco regulatory science. So kind of simple, straightforward explaining things and why you did them is a is a good idea don't assume that that your experts the experts in your field are reading it wonderful thank you so much to the panelists for your insights and your time today i know all of you are very busy people so really appreciate you being here and taking the time to talk to us and also to the audience for coming and listening and asking your questions uh, we hope that it was useful to you. This is recorded, so we'll put it on our website if the panelists give permission uh, to do so. We did have some slides, which we will share after the fact. There will be an evaluation that you will get after you, uh, I guess, leave the meeting. So please fill that out. And the critical part of that evaluation is, what would you like to see more of in terms of this grant making space from our center? Because we really do wanna serve that need for you and provide as many resources as possible for you to become successful independent researchers in public health, specifically in TRS, but also you know, in your journey in this field. So uh, again, thank you all. We're at time, so I wanna be mindful of everybody's time. We'll stop now. Take care, be well, and we'll see you again.